Okay, well, thanks for having me back. I know it's uh, always challenging when you have two uh, speaker do two talks. Guess what? This is the same slide I showed you last time. <clears throat> and I thought, I think Sid Singh originally created this slide deck. I have no idea who originally created it, but I just updated a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the approved biologics for Crohn's disease, some leukocyte traffic inhibitors, IL-1223s, and then some new therapies. So October 2nd, 1998, the first patient received infliximab uh, commercially for the treatment of Crohn's disease. Now, I infused a patient at 8 a.m. I actually just saw her the other day. Uh, I just infused a patient at 8 a.m., and I used to tell people I infused the first patient until Dan Present pointed out that Chicago was on Central Time and he's on Eastern Time, and then he did one at 8 a.m. too. So he claims he beat me, and um, I'll let him stick with that. Um, and then uh, there came a very long delay. You know, remember the meetings back then? People were jumping up and down, all these other therapies, and, you know, within two years we're going to have this one, we'll have that one, that one. Do you know how many years it took till we had the next different FDA-approved biologic for treatment of IBD? Nine years. That means for nine years, all I was able to talk about was one thing. You know how boring that became? It was dreadful. <laughs> and luckily, I wasn't the audience. But uh, so in, in 2005, infliximab was approved for ulcerative colitis, but it was the same therapy. And it wasn't until 2007, um, adalimumab, and then 2008, natalizumab, sertalizumab. And you can see this slide. The things that are orange are, are oral therapies. The things that are green are IV therapies, and the things that are blue are subcutaneous therapies. It took me like 25 minutes to figure that out. So you can see that until, uh, as I mentioned um, uh, recently, until 2014, other than natalizumab, who prob probably you guys don't use, um, we really only had anti-TNFs, and now um, we have um, a few different uh, therapies. This includes the biosimilars, but we have a lot of things coming through for phase three. And then I always love these, these pictures. Um, they show, you know, the little cartoon of the bowel and all the different things that, that happen. But it shows the different pathways for which therapies work. Um, and I think that um, uh, it's, it's exciting because it brings back the thought that all those years when you sat through those long basic science presentations, all of a sudden it's finally coming to fruition. So, Here's some data on vetalizumab for Crohn's disease. And uh, this uh, data was the um, in induction uh, data, which showed the drug in orange and placebo in blue. You can see remission on the left and response on the right. The remission rates in induction, 14.5%. People didn't fall off their chair, but their, their placebo rate was 6.8, so that's a pretty good study. And then you can see the maintenance data and the, um, the uh, uh, paler orange, again, I, I think that choosing colors for slides probably could be a little better difference, um, is the every eight week, um, which we use for patients uh, for maintenance. And you can see that um, about a third to a half of the patients maintained in Crohn's disease. But what's interesting is in, de in the case of vetalizumab is that the difference um, for the patients who failed anti-TNFs, um, as was just previously mentioned, is, is kind of disappointing. People who have failed anti-TNFs the data really didn't separate out from placebo, while those who were naive to, to TNFs, it actually did. And um, what, we're, what we're doing now is um, we don't know why to TNF um, refractory patients, whether they are just harder to treat, which some will be, and everything's not going to work as well, or are we ch making some changes in the patients which make them more difficult to treat. Now, there is data suggesting from years ago that if you treat with corticosteroids, you actually can make patients more, less, less uh, likely to respond to other therapies. Uh, and that's why we've been trying to get people even to, to skip the corticosteroid step or at least uh, skip prolonged corticosteroids. So it remains to be seen whether that's true with the, with the TNF therapies. And what was very nice is, um, this was a clinical prediction tool in the case for vetalizumab from this paper where patients got points. It's better to have points. So if they never had bowel surgery, they got two points. And if they never had TNFs, they got three points. And no fistulizing disease, they got two points. If they're based on their albumin, they got points. And then based on their CRP, if their CRP was elevated, they lost points. And then what they looked at was the probability of responding to vetalizumab. So if they had a lot, remember, a lot of points are good. That means you're not that sick, you don't have fish disease, you had not previous surgery, TNFs, then the green, you can see 
that the um, clinical remission and, and um, steroid free remission rates, everything was good. If you had some points, uh, but not a lot, then you were intermediate. But if you were someone who already had kind of been through the mill, your, your likelihood of responding to vetalizumab was, was very low. Now, it would be helpful if we actually had these studies verified for not just vetalizumab, for others too. And then you might imagine an algorithm, perhaps on your smartphone, where you would plug in what the patients had, and then it might give you the best likelihood of something working. Um, this, I'm going to read every single line of this slide. No, I'm not. So the long-term safety of vetalizumab is one of the reasons why many people are leading with vetalizumab, certainly in ulcerative colitis and even in Crohn's disease patients as a first-line therapy because the safety is essentially the same as placebo for virtually all outcomes. And, uh, as we, and one, of the, one of the things um, that was mentioned is that most of us, and you should consider this too, are actually leapfrogging azathioprine, 6-MP, and methotrexate in the management of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease now, unless you're going to add it on to a TNF for better efficacy. We're going straight to biologics in people with moderate to severe disease, which is, um, which is how they were um, studied and approved, and many of us are going straight to vetalizumab, particularly as the initial biologic, because of the safety data. And certainly in people, you've got some of those who you know, have known me for many years, like Marla, um, have realized that I'm turning blonde. Uh, and uh, if you have your patients who are turning blonde, or in the case of guys who, who are um, turning without any hair, uh, you may want to consider using um, vetalizumab for the safety. And we're even moving our patients who are well on azathioprine, 6-MP, and methotrexate onto vetalizumab. Usakinumab uh, is um, uh, the first of hopefully uh, many therapies in this family. Turns out interleukin-12 and interleukin-23 share a P40 subunit, so it's actually an anti-P40 monoclonal antibody. And um, what was very interesting in this agent is there is benefit in people who have failed anti-TNFs. So um, again, the numbers uh, uh, aren't um, uh, fantastic, but the blue is the IV um, uh, induction, uh, the, the purple is placebo, ignore the orange. And you can see that even in the anti-TNF failures, you had a clear benefit over placebo um, in week three, week six, uh, week eight, although again, the TNF naive patients always, always did better. And you can look at C-reactive protein, uh, the people on placebo and purple, their C-reactive protein stayed the same, while those who got the drug it went down in both, in both the studies. It's hard, to, I know, to, to see, but take my word over. Uh, and then this was maintenance, uh, and right, uh, the, the approval in the U.S. is every eight weeks, which is in blue. You can see the every 12-week data is kind of comparable. So um, in Europe, in some instances, people are doing really well. Some people have gone to every 12 weeks um, uh, because the data is pretty comparable between the blue and the orange for, for maintenance. I say certainly for your patients, if they do exceptionally well, what I do is that they say, oh, you know, I'm going to be a little late for my uh, infusion. And I say, well, well, that's okay. And you can see what's very nice, the steroid-free remission rate is, is nearly half the patients. So uh, again, it was. This came out in 2016. For us, it was already on the market for psoriasis. Uh, the only drawback is that it takes two approvals. You have to get the IV approved and then, and then the sub-Q. Um, but that's getting much better now, too. Um, this is one of the slides um, uh, that people always hate because it shows different trials for different agents. But uh, in the bio-naive patients, and of course, in infliximab data, remember, everyone was bio-naive. So you didn't have people who failed everything else. Uh, you can see the infliximab studies uh, are red, uh, the adalimumab studies are green, uh, the sertalizumab studies are blue. You can see the placebo rates in yellow, so um, uh, it's a little harder to know because in some studies that have very high placebo rates, why were those patients in the study? Their investigators put them in and they, they probably didn't really have very active inflammatory disease, and that's why they did so well on placebo. And the more recently, vetalizumab is in whatever, that strange greenish color, and usakinumab is in orange. So um, uh, if you look very, at the very first study, the Targan study for Crohn's, only one patient who got placebo went into remission um, back then. Those were the good old days. So then looking at this, and, and uh, if, if you like emojis, um, you'll love this slide. Uh, this looked at estimated rates of induction and maintenance of remission for his first line therapy for Crohn's disease. You can see the placebo um, uh, rates above, and then um, the infliximab, adalimumab, sertalizumab, vedalizumab, and ustekinumab. 
um, at least from this study, the, the strongest um, uh, uh, data um, for uh, remission and maintenance seems to be with the anti-TNFs, although the quality of the evidence wasn't very good for some of the early studies as well, too. So again, difficult, difficult to tell. I think, I think what may be a little more helpful for you is, is looking at whether the patients also have other inflammatory conditions, whether they have fistulous disease, what they've had beforehand, and helping you make these decisions. Um, there are some head-to-head -head trials uh, that are um, ongoing or upcoming. One of them is a head-to-head -head between ustekinumab and adalimumab. Um, and the second one is an experimental anti-IL-23 bezikumab. Oh, I think that's one of the study qu uh, questions from the beginning. First, adalimumab or placebo. Um, uh, unfortunately, there's placebo in this trial, a little harder to recruit patients. And then we're even looking at high, standard versus high-dose adalimumab, both in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, um, where the patients get 160, 160, 160. They get a, a, a bigger load of adalimumab. I mean, remember initially I said we had nine years um, between the infliximab trial and adalimumab's approval. Well, why is that? Well, it turns out, guess what we learned? we learned that Crohn's patients require higher doses than the RA patients. So the studies were initially done giving the standard RA dosing. They don't, they, they, they don't give a load for adalimumab for RA. They don't need to. And uh, the psoriasis patients, I mean, they all do, you know, the rheumatologists and dermatologists, they have it easy. Their patients don't need super high level loads. They get things approved very easily. It's very easy to see with psoriasis whether something's working. Just look at the darn skin. That's why the biosimilar um, data is all in those conditions. Um, but as a result of the Crohn's and then also the colitis patients needing higher loads, that delayed the, the approval um, for these agents for these diseases. So probably a little more interesting is it's what's, what's coming out. And some of these things you actually will see in your lifetime. <laughs> so the JAK inhibitors. So all, everything that we've shown you so far, other than the tofacitinib data in, in UC, everything else for the monoclonal antibodies are monoclonal antibodies. They prevent the, the target, let's say it's TNF or interleukin-12-23, from reaching the cell receptors. Maybe they, uh, they actually bind to it in the serum or maybe uh, uh, end up um, uh, d uh, deleting the uh, cells that are making it. But what happens if interferon, if the interleukins, if, if, IL, if they reach the cell surface without being blocked by the drug? Well, inside the cell, you have what's called signal transduction. The signal from the receptor activates the JAK protein, the Janus kinase proteins, and then they transduce with the, with the STAT proteins the signal from the cell surface to the nucleus to actually make a difference in the cell. So the JAK inhibitor's idea is completely different than the biologics. Everyone throws them into one, surface, one, one sentence, but it's completely different. This is why they're oral. They're called small molecules. Well, guess what? Aspirin's a small molecule. Almost anything you, Lipitor is a small molecule. Almost anything you take by mouth to be absorbed in, in the body is a small molecule. But they're novel small molecules. This is why they can charge so much for them. And they, uh, and they, they are the next phase of blocking things. And there are different JAK proteins and STAT ones. And based upon what disease you're treating, you might want to target certain ones. So, um, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, I mentioned to you the ustekinumab is an IL-1223. It blocks IL-12 and 23. Well, guess what they found out in psoriasis? If you just block interleukin-23, you actually not only beat the anti-TNS in psoriasis, you actually even beat the IL-1223. In fact, one of the companies uh, has the first IL-1223 in the market and the first IL-23 in the market versus psoriasis. They did a head-to-head -head study against their own drug and shown that the anti-IL-23 is superior to IL-1223. So you're going to see in studies a lot of IL-23 inhibitors. This is uh, Rizinkizumab. Uh, the drug dose that uh, is, uh, it's probably going to use is in green, and placebo is in gray. And you can see that all the outcomes here, remission, response, endoscopic mucosal healing, are better with the drug. The safety has been very, very good. There's some nausea, but no other major findings, um, uh, which, which is helpful. Uh, a different uh, molecule, i.e. a different company, uh, Brazicumab. This is phase 2A study. The drug is the dark color, 
uh, maybe it's darkish blue, black, and the placebo is the white. And uh, you can see the clinical response difference um, was not different, nor the remission, although if you did clinical response and a 50% reduction in cow protection or CRP, you did have a big difference. So this suggests the patients who had active inflammation, that's where it worked, and those are the people you want to use it in. Um, uh, so the, um, as far as the JAK inhibitors, as you know, you already have tofacitinib on the market for ulcerative colitis. Tofacitinib is a non-selective JAK inhibitor. It means it has activity against JAK1, JAK2, and JAK3, but primarily JAK1 and 3. So the thought is, well, maybe we want to just predominantly um, uh, target JAK1 because um, you don't want to block JAK2. It's really bad. So um, there's a number of therapies that are um, on being, going through development, selective JAK1 inhibitors. Again, Janus kinase, these are going to be pill therapies. Okay. So well, what happened about tofacitinib? So we studied it. We, they studied it. We all studied it in, in Crohn's disease as well, too. And the problem is here is that the placebo remission rate, 37 percent, uh, right? The placebo, um, uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, the placebo re remission rate in the induction study, oh, this is the, old, the second induction, right, it was 37 percent, and the drug was only 43 percent. And oh, here it is. The clinical response rate for placebo, 55.6 percent of patients with moderate severe Crohn's disease responded to placebo. What are you going to do with a trial like that? Okay, you're either going to patent the placebo, <laughs> or as unfortunately company found, you're not, even though your drug worked in 70% of patients, you still, you still it didn't be placebo. So uh, unfortunately, it means there's something wrong with the study that so many people who were supposedly sick got better with placebo. Subsequently, the next study in, in Crohn's also with tofacinib didn't really show a benefit with placebo. Again, high, not this high, but still high rates of placebo. So this is why you're not going to be seeing um, this, at least now for Crohn's, probably not. And if you've ever tried to get this through insurance companies, you may, after these studies came out, because initially we were able to get it through insurance, the insurance company said, no, the study's negative, and, and you have to pick your battles. Um, this is a selective JAK1 inhibitor for Crohn's disease. As I mentioned, um, maybe blocking JAK1 is better than blocking um, 1 and 3. Uh, and the drug is in red, and placebo is in blue. And if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the clinical remission rates just keep on going up nicely, start tapering off with the drug, while the placebo ones really, really uh, don't, don't go anywhere. There, was a, there is a higher rate of serious infections with, with this agent. Um, in the, but however, um, you know, j just um, going on the comments in the previous, uh, the tofacitinib, while the, this rheumatoid arthritis trial with higher doses, in people 50 years and older with one or more cardiovascular risk factors did have higher rates of pulmonary embolism and deaths. It hasn't been seen in the UC data or any of the other RA data at the higher dose. So it's unclear why that particular study showed that. Upadacitinib, which is a different JAK1 inhibitor, um, uh, you know, diff different company. Uh, you can see the drug uh, in red in the middle dose and dark blue in the higher dose and placebo in light blue. And again, so people who make slides don't use the same color for different groups. Like you, they should have made the placebo like yellow or white or like not a different color blue because sometimes, you know, a projector, like it projects differently. Here, let me show you what the screen looks like. Uh, it's different colors up here than over there. How am I how are you supposed to know? Those two almost look the same. Okay? Different colors. So. Different mechanism, vetalizumab and some of the other ones under, under development actually work by cellular trafficking. So how do I explain that to my patients as my time's running out? I say, imagine the hallway is the bloodstream and you're sitting in the colon or the small intestine room. The lock and key for vetalizumab only allows or, or prevents the white blood cells from getting into the room with the bowel, but it doesn't prevent the heart room and the lung room and the skin room. That's why you have the safety of it's selective for patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, this study, this is uh, an, just, just anti-beta-7, um, which also um, looks at um, uh, releasing of the white blood cells from the lymph, uh, the lymph nodes, shows benefit at the, again, they use the same colors <laughs> for the two doses, okay? The placebo is pink and the active drugs are in the, the I mean, the placebo is gray and the active drugs are in the two different shades of pink. Um, 
This is an alpha or al anti-alpha 4 beta 7, a different drug. And here you can see, again, they use the placebo is in light blue, and the drugs in dark blue, and, and the drugs in red. You can see a benefit as well, too. There was me, uh, m a brief mention of this oral sphingosin receptor agonist, ozonamide. So um, uh, there is currently uh, on the market for multiple sclerosis fill, uh, a, 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 a similar medicine uh, to ozonamide, and this drug actually may make it through now for MS, and we're excited as an oral agent for patients with Crohn's disease and even ulcerative colitis. But remember, not everything that claims to work does. There was an oral SMAD7, uh, and I didn't um, uh, draw this. Everything is black, unfortunately. The placebos on the left, you can see the drug rates are much higher. This was published in this little known journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. And one of the lessons is, if you're going to make, a, make a, a, a drug, A, don't name it after yourself, which they did, and B, make sure it really works endoscopically before you submit to the New England Journal of Medicine, because guess what? The drug doesn't work. Whoops. And uh, one company that bought this drug for $5.5 billion is a little unhappy about that. Uh, finally, stem cell therapies. Placebo is in blue. Uh, these are, these are um, patients who had um, uh, uh, stem cells injected into their perianal fistula for Crohn's disease. You can see a benefit um, in the patients who received the, the stem cells. And there's a different stem cell therapy also ongoing right now. Um, with injections and closing of the fistulas, which is very interesting. And this is a, these therapies are approved in Europe and in Israel and perhaps other countries. They're not approved in the United States yet, uh, but we're moving through that right now. So in summary, the TNF agents as maybe have the best data for induction, at least for Crohn's disease. Um, if you're TNI, TNF um, non-responding and you don't need surgery, most of them do, but if they really don't need surgery, then ustekinumab has some good data. That elizumab safety profile is unbeatable. There's a bunch of oral agents, the JAK inhibitors and others, coming down the pipeline. You may see uh, injections of stem cells into the fistulas. And thank you very much.